All right, welcome to technical session number 41, where we are going to begin our introduction into security. Uh, probably our next five or six sessions we're gonna be going over are gonna be surrounding uh, this aspect of cybersecurity, prevention methods, things to look out for, and get you guys pretty well versed in some of the basics with regards to it. So with this technical session, since it is kind of just our introduction into it, we're going to kind of briefly explain why cybersecurity is an important, um, an important element of IT in general. We're going to be talking about some common threats and vulnerabilities that um, they're basically silos, which other stuff is going to be housed under. And then we're going to be identifying different types of malware and social engineering threats that you need to be aware of. Social engineering being one of the biggest vulnerabilities with any, any company you work for. And it's kind of one of those things where everybody loves to believe or wants to believe like, I am not susceptible to those kind of attacks. You absolutely are. Everyone is. That's why, you know, like you ever heard of the term con man and con is short for confidence. And it's not the confidence of the person performing the scam. They're relying upon your confidence that you think you cannot be tricked. So they're playing on that. That's where the confidence or con man term comes from. So in this one, it's kind of fitting. We need to worry, you know, talk about adaptability. The threats and vulnerabilities and things in this cybersecurity environment are constantly changing thousands of new viruses every day. Um, it is a very, very, rapidly changing environment in cybersecurity. So we need to be able to change with it. So adaptability is crucial. Maintaining that growth mindset. I don't know a lot about cybersecurity right now, but I intend to know a lot about it in the future. You know, I know I can wrap my head around these concepts. I can understand what's going on and I can build upon them. So overview of security. Yuki, can you please start us off? Yes, security overview. Information security is the collection of technologies, standards, policies, and management practices that are applied to information to keep it secure. It is vital to be worried about information security because much of the value of a business is concentrated in the value of, the, of its information. To fully understand why information security is important, one needs to understand both the value of information and the consequences of such information being compromised. Excellent. Thank you, Yuki. So what makes one company more valuable over another? If it's a service-based company, it's how it performs its services. How does it troubleshoot when issues arrive? What are the policies and procedures? How do they train their staff? This can make or break a company. You can try to model it based from the outside, but having access to their training methods, uh, policies and procedures, standard operating procedures, um, and all of that would essentially give them the ability to mimic your business model, devaluing what you have created. It's a little bit easier to think about it in terms of manufacturing. You have research and development teams. You spend years and millions of dollars developing a product to get it ready for market. And then if somebody can swoop in at the last minute, take that information, clone your product and sell it for a third the price. You can't even recuperate your costs. And they didn't have to spend those millions of dollars to develop that product. They just got that finished piece, put it into manufacturing, and they're good to go. So information is some of the most valuable things you have as an organization. And we have to look at information in three different ways. We're not going to get into this real heavily, but we have to look at information in transit, information in use, and information in rest. And we have to treat them in those different stages with different security procedures. It's most vulnerable in transit. So 
So when you're sending information over the internet, that's usually the point at which it is most vulnerable. It is usually not as vulnerable when it's sitting on your hard drive. So some threats and vulnerabilities that we need to keep in mind. Um, as you heard us say earlier on, we were say, we talked about an antivirus. And I said, we needed to get a little bit more comfortable with saying things like anti-malware because viruses are very specific things. We're gonna be talking today and kind of breaking it down and letting you know like the difference between say a virus and a worm, you know, or a botnet, something like that. So we're gonna be breaking these terms down a little bit more, have them make a little bit more sense to us. The seven main silos we're gonna be talking about, we're gonna be talking about malware. What does that entail? We're gonna be talking about social engineering, uh, password attacks, zombie botnets, man in the middle attacks, zero day, and violations of security best practices. Number two and number seven typically are where your biggest vulnerabilities are in any organization. Much like when we talk about troubleshooting and uh, solving problems on a computer, the majority of the time it is user error, same holds true for security. The majority of the time it is a social engineering attack or them not following proper procedures that allows a virus or malware to enter the system. Malware is short for malicious software and it includes a family of types of software. It is meant to disrupt your op operations or gather sensitive information or gain, in, gain access to private computer systems and as well display unwanted advertising, which I'm sure a lot of us have experienced at some point in our life. So the common types we'll be discussing are viruses, worms, spyware, Trojans, rootkits, and ransomware. And start breaking these down and distinguish between them a little bit. <clears throat> I would take a snapshot of this page. This is a good one to know, not just for personal use, but uh, they do like to ask questions about this as well. So what are some symptoms that you would have of a malware slash virus infection? So programs loading slowly, you know, like this would be a noticeable change um, in how long it takes for systems to boot up or programs to load. And it kind of lets you know that viruses are spreading to other files and throughout your system, and it's starting to take it over and utilize more and more of the system's resources. Another example would be file, files appearing and disappearing. So some of the attacks that they like to use, they like to rename files, change files, move files. And sometimes they're adding files to your system uh, to kind of hide the viruses there. Program size is another good one. Um, When you get the installed version, say it's supposed to be, you know, 300 megabytes for this little application you get. And then later it's determined that it's like five gigs rather than 350 megs. There's a lot of bloat in there, a lot of other stuff that has been kind of shoved in with that um, initial applications of program size. And this is also how they kind of sneak things in or hide things. Unusual operating characteristics. Browsers, word processing applications, other software start to look different or change without you making those changes or doing updates. So your menus may change. Certain things that you were able to do before could be disappearing. Um, certain things that you weren't, you know, like there might be weird things showing up in your menus. Uh, the look and feel of it may change. Security options could be removed uh, so that it makes it harder for you to uh, notice what's going on. Um, they could be starting up or, or just randomly closing on their own. 
Um, and that leads us to the mysterious shutdown and start up. So your system mysteriously shuts itself down, starts itself up, or does a whole lot of disk activity That's that you weren't trying to start up a new program, you weren't searching for files, you weren't running videos, but all of a sudden you just hear your disk drive just going crazy. So it's not like you're using a bunch of RAM and you're needing to use the swap file. No, you're sitting there, the computer appears to be idle, but it starts writing and reading from the drive like crazy. Reboot or startup errors, you get the BOSOT error. Um, when you're booting up, it's giving you unexpected error messages. Always take note of what those error messages are because uh, that'll help kind of lead you to what type of you know, virus it is or how to fix the problem. Um, local access to system, or excuse me, you lose access to system resources. So you mysteriously can't access your disk drive. You can't access a particular hard drive. You can access, you know, a touchpad. Certain things you start losing access to, which you've had consistent access to prior. So the viruses are making changes to the system, trying to make it unusable to you. All right. What essentially is a virus and what does a virus do? So this is one particular piece of malware. <clears throat> They're trying to accomplish generally one of two things, which is either render the system unusable. So essentially trying to crash your system so that you can't function. Or, or and spread to other systems to continue to wreak havoc. How do viruses spread? <clears throat> Once a system is infected, the virus can start attaching itself to pretty much any file. Uh, each time the user tries to send a file, email a file, or what have you, it's trying to attach itself to anything that you're sending out so that it can spread itself as, e as quickly and as easily as possible. The majority of viruses today are spread through email utilizing you know people sending pictures people sending documents files things like that uh, the virus attaches itself to that file and the recipient unknowingly opens it inviting that virus into their system that is why um, many companies will use something that's called hashing uh, which is a one-way encryption that basically tells you if anything has changed. So if I took a book that was say 10,000 pages long, and then I went into page, you know, and I ran a hash algorithm on it, it would give me an output of a series of random numbers and letters. And that is my, my hash. I go into page 950 and I change a lowercase letter to an uppercase letter. That's all I do. I run that hash algorithm over that, that book again, and I will get a completely different algorithm. So one minor change completely changes what the algorithm looks like. So the reason somebody would give you a hash of a program is so when you receive it, you can run a hash on that program before you open it and make sure that it is the exact same program that was meant to be sent to you. So that's kind of one way to get around it with viruses being sent over the mail. All right, types of viruses. I know we're like, we're now into a list within a list at this point. So different types of viruses um, that you can come across they all kind of have their own unique little signatures. Uh, we have a list of them here that we do need to be aware of what they are. Um, you have your armored virus, companion, macro, retro, polymorphic, phage, stealth, resident, overwrite, and multi-partite. 
So each of them are kind of unique. Some of them are kind of similar, but we do, you know, these are the families that viruses kind of fall into. All right, first, armored virus. JR, can you please read to us about an armored virus? Armored virus is designed to make itself difficult to detect or analyze. Armored viruses cover themselves with protective code that stops debuggers or disassemblers from examining critical elements of the virus. The virus may be written in such a way that some aspects of the programming act as a decoy to distract analysts while the actual code hides in other areas in the program. The key to stopping most viruses is to identify them quickly and educate administrators about them. The very things that the armor intensifies the difficulty of accomplishing. Excellent. Campaign Thank you. Oh. <laughs> we'll get into that one in just a second. Appreciate it. So yeah, armor viruses, it has a code of armor essentially around it. Um, because when viruses are detected, people will intentionally infect a virtual machine or something like that, or analyze the code because they're gonna to wanna to see how the virus behaves, what code is being utilized, um, what techniques are they using? And armored viruses intentionally try to obfuscate that so that it's very hard to figure out what exactly it is they're trying to do, um, which part of the code is the most critical, how to shut them down, things like that. So it's the main thing, armored virus designed to make itself difficult to detect or analyze. Tomas, can you read about a companion virus please for us? Companion virus attaches itself to legitimate programs and then creates a program with a different file extension. The file may reside in your system's temporary directory. When a user types the name of the legitimate program, the companion virus executes instead of the real program, effectively hiding the virus from other users or from users. Excellent. So kind of if you're going to send a file, like an application, and there's multiple little files within that application, the companion virus is going to create a file for itself and hide itself amongst those other, you know, files inside that larger application. And when you try to execute the main file, if you search for it, that basically has written itself to execute itself before the legitimate program. So it's hiding itself in other programs and kind of operates as kind of a companion that moves with it. All right, macro virus. Bernard, can you read for us, please? All right, macro virus explodes the enhancement of made too many application programs. For example, Microsoft Office supports many basic programming languages, language that allows files to be manipulated automatically. These programs in the document are called macros. Macro viruses can infect all the documents in your system and spread to other systems via email or other methods. Excellent, thank you. Um, another way to kind of ex you know explain what a macro was the first time I came across it, I thought it was one of the coolest things ever. Um, it's like if you have repetitive tasks that you need to do, like where you're having to do the same thing over and over and over again. Like um, when I was working in transportation, we would have to put in uh, the date and time and the checkout and all that stuff for equipment once we have returned it to the railroad. Sometimes we would have to do this for hundreds of, of containers a day. But what we could do is we could create a quick macro that would record us doing it once and then repetitively do this for every single file 
we wished to have this happen. It saved us a ton of time. So this essentially works in other programs too, where you can do this, you can create these programs that automatically make things happen for you. The macro virus exploits this and sets these up in your system so that your systems will automatically run certain aspects or programs every time you're manipulating them or using them. So without you initiating it, it's going ahead and doing other things. So that is a macro virus. Danielle, can you read for us about a retrovirus, please? I have one question about the macro virus, right? Yes. So you know the program that you said that um, that you guys use. Did you guys create your own virus, or was that something that? Well, no. That what we created was a macro. Oh, a macro. Okay. So, so a macro is a way to automate processes. Okay, so the my macro virus only happens if you're using macro. No. The macro virus is using macros to automate things it wants to do to your oh, system. Okay, I get it. So it's using commands and macro processes in order to make your system do things you don't want it to do. Okay, I understand. Okay. And it could be just to chew up resources so it makes it, you know, slows your computer down. It could be um, adding text into documents that you already have. Uh, one of them, it was back in the late 90s, but I think it was like the I love you or the Melissa virus, I think it was, where it would type I love you over and over and over again in a document. Macro, it was creating an automated process where it kept repeating certain things over and over again in your systems. Okay, makes sense. Okay, um, retrovirus attacks or bypass the antivirus software installed on a computer. Retroviruses can directly attack an antivirus software and potentially destroy the virus depth definition database file mm -hmm. okay destroying this information without your knowledge would leave you with a full sense of security this virus virus may also directly attack an antivirus program to create to create bypass for itself very good so essentially it gets in and it starts one of two things it can do so every virus, every antivirus, what it's doing is it's looking for what are called signatures. It's certain types of code or behaviors. And all those signatures for every type of virus are kept in what is called the definitions list. It's basically just a list of hundreds of thousands of viruses that are active. And it tells the antivirus, this is what you look for. This is the kind of code that, you know, you should, if you see it, you need to stop it or remove it or quarantine it or what have you. So the retrovirus can come in and just kind of delete all that. And every time you try to update it, it keeps deleting it. So you think your system is safe because your, your antivirus is running and saying, nope, we don't see anything because it has nothing to compare it to, no list to actually look at it. That's one way they can do it. And the other thing is basically just attacking the antivirus and saying, hey, just don't look over here. You can scan over there. You can scan over there. You can scan over there. Just don't look at me. So your antivirus would still be picking up certain things, but would actively miss the retrovirus because the virus is basically telling the antivirus, don't look here. Does it make sense? Please go watch the movie Hackers. Now you're gonna laugh your tail off when you watch that movie. <laughs> it's like, so like that's like the cops looking for you and be like hey uh, don't look over here i'm not i'm not I'm yeah not well, that's me. that's a retro <laughs> no but uh steven was the culprit <laughs> no steven was commenting in the chat he's like i'm gonna go watch the movie hackers which is like a, a late 90s movie with uh angelina jolie and then the guy from uh with from uh elementary it was the sherlock holmes series so it was like those two people in it. And if you go watch it and you start looking at the technology and what they're doing based off of what you know now, you're going to be laughing your tail off. I'm definitely not going to look for it now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. You know, like I go back and watch it. It does not hold up well, <laughs> especially when you start learning about computers. So. All right. Next. 
continue on just a little bit more. We're going to talk about the polymorphic virus. That's what I have to say in my head about 20 times before I actually say it out loud because it does not roll off the tongue very well. Um, let's see here. Da, da, da. Rebecca, can you please read to us about a polymorphic virus? Changes from in order to avoid detection, the virus will attempt to hide from antivirus software. Frequently, the virus will encrypt part of the part of itself to avoid detection. When the virus does, does this, it referred to as mutation. The mutation process makes it hard for antivirus software to detect common characters for the virus. Excellent, thank you. So polymorphic. So it's like many changes is essentially what that translates into. So it is continually trying to change and adapt and move and, and shift in order to avoid detection. So unlike the retrovirus, where the retrovirus is actively telling the antivirus, don't look at me, the polymorphic is trying to hide from the antivirus. And so it can take pieces of its code because it's look, you know, the antivirus is looking for that signature, that, that particular code that points out what kind of virus it is. So the polymorphic is trying to encrypt pieces of it and make it unreadable so that it is hard for the antivirus to actually say, okay, this is a true signature, we need to delete this. And then every time it changes, it's called a mutation. So it's, it's adapting, it's changing into something else. Does this make sense? All right. Since you're wearing a Star Trek shirt, Oscar, and this next one always reminds me of Star Trek, you get the phage virus, sir. <laughs> phage virus alters other programs and databases. The virus infects all these files. The only way to remove this virus is to reinstall the programs that are infected. If you miss even a single incident of this virus on the victim system, the process will start again and affect the system once more. All right. So it tries to spread to as many files as it possibly can on your system, replicating itself and infecting all these programs. And the only method you have is scorched earth. Once it touches a system or a process or whatever, it has to be completely removed and reinstalled. It's, it's tainted. It cannot be reused. So sometimes you have to do the King method and completely re-image your drives. If you catch it early enough, you may be lucky and only have to reinstall particular programs. But again, if you miss a single instance of this or a single piece of it, it will reinfect the entire system. All right. Mitzi, can you please read about the stealth virus for us, please? Stealth virus attempts to avoid detection by masking itself from applications. It may attach itself to the bot, the boot sector of the hard drive. When a system utility or program runs, the chills virus redirects commands around itself in order to avoid detection. There you go. So it tries to embed itself as deep as possible, tells any programs or utilities that you're trying to utilize to kind of move around itself. So if we're trying to do like file system checker or something like that, it's gonna to try to redirect these programs around itself to stay hidden, stealth. It's trying to hide itself and avoid detection as long as possible. I do recommend in the book, Pages 1201 to 1203, they go over a lot of this stuff in pretty brief detail, but kind of breaks it down in a good way. So um, I do recommend doing that. It's the physical book.
Cybex book. So I would recommend please taking the time to do that because you will receive questions on different types of viruses. Like they'll explain something that's going on and say, hey, and it'll be pretty obvious which one they're pointing to if you, you have a general idea as to what these are. What kind of virus does this sound like? All right. Last three for viruses. Yes, Danielle. I have a question about the last slide, right? The, um, what was it? These viruses sound the same, the, the first one and the last one, but what's the difference of them? Oh, okay, that's software and that's hard drive? Yeah. Okay, okay, I got it. Wrong. So there's little, there's little subtle differences between the two. So I would make like a Quizlet slide deck on the different types of viruses. I would do that just because it kind of familiarizes you with what they do. A lot of times the names will tell you what they are, like polymorphic, poly meaning many, morphic meaning change. So it's trying to, it changes over time to avoid detection. So it's changing multiple times and each change is referred to as a mutation. Um, stealth virus, it's trying to hide itself, but it's hiding itself from system processes. Retrovirus is trying to, it's specifically trying to attack or redirect the antivirus program. Macro is trying to use automated processes to its advantage and disrupt or um, slow down the system. You know, so it's just kind of going through each of these and finding little pieces that make them different and trying to cling to that and remember what that is. Do you need to be an expert in these? No, this is introducing you to this world, kind of getting you familiar with the different families of viruses and, and, and types of cybersecurity threats that are out there. This is a very top level, you know, look at it. Each layer you go, when you know, like if you continue on from here going into Network Plus and Security Plus and all that stuff, you start going deeper and deeper and deeper into these subjects. But you just need to have mostly a topical view of it at this point. Does that help? Yes, that was helpful. Okay. All right. The resident virus. Stephen, can you read for us, please? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, resident virus, it hides and stores itself within the computer memory, which then allows it to infect any file that is run by the computer. It will load its replication uh, module into the memory so it does not need to be executed for it to infect other files. Rather, it activates whenever the operating system loads or operates a specific function. This virus may be one of the worst kinds as they can affect the system thoroughly, even attaching itself to the antivirus applications, which allows it to infect any file scanned by the program. So particularly nasty one, right? So this one essentially is attaching itself to the RAM modules. And so any processes that are activated or run by that system will subsequently become infected to the point where it can even use its own, your own antivirus against you. And so as your antivirus is scanning the entire system, any, any file or application or piece that is not infected is subsequently getting infected by this particular virus. And then once you, if you send an email or a file or a document out to anybody, it infects their system and then spreads throughout their system as quickly as possible. So resident virus resides in the memory in the RAM module. Two to go. 
Stephanie, can you please write, read to us about the overwrite, overwriting virus? Overwriting virus effectively destroys the originally programmed code, typically by overwriting data in the system memory. Typically, users will need to remove the offending virus and then reinstall the original program which can be difficult depending on whether the original program were backed up or kept in duplicate copies offline. Yep, thank you. One of the nasty things that some viruses can do, remember we talked about restore points where you can kind of go back in time and bring your system back to a previous state. Some of the first things that overriding viruses and stuff will do is they will attack those virus the uh, those restore points in your system. So even if you restore to a previous state your system files, they've already been infected. So essentially, your backups have been infected if they're already on that system. Which is why they're stating here you would need offline duplicate copies in order to start anew. You cannot use what was already there on the system because the overwriting is changing the code and essentially trying to set it up so that it's very difficult to remove itself. Questions so far on this? Another question, but I always wondering who's making this uh, virus, like who's creating them? Very nice people. Um, so it's generally, you know, like there, there are hackers and there's different types of hackers. They have different reasons for doing what they're doing. There's those who just want to kind of spread chaos. They're looking to, you know, cause as much havoc and, and destruction as they, as they can. Uh, there's people that do it for money. Uh, where they try to take over your systems and then have you charge them or have you pay them money to fix the problem that they themselves created. There are those that are trying to make a name for themselves where they're trying to get known in the industry. And so they'll create something like this to create havoc, say, hey, here's what I did. Here's how I bypassed your security. Would you like to hire me as a consultant to show how this will not happen again? Um, and then there are uh, what are called APTs or advanced persistent threats. That is usually a government or um, organized crime unit that has a lot of resources at their disposal that will continually attack systems. So, you know, there's, there's different types of people that do these things for different reasons. Sometimes you'll have people create them just to see if it's possible. You know, like they're doing it for research purposes to say, hey, I wonder if I did this, could I bypass this? Um, and these would be like, you know, what are called white hat hackers uh, for security purposes, just to try to test the security system uh, to make it as robust as possible, to make it harder for people to uh, get past. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier in this uh, cohort, there's a, uh, an, uh, an old military, like a Roman saying, which is Siwis Pacum Parabellum, which is if you want peace, prepare for war. So in cybersecurity, you want to try to think like a hacker. You want to think like somebody who's going to be attacking your systems, because if you can see how they would attack you, you can defend yourself better. Does that make sense, Nesinet? Yes. So there's uh, some smart people, they do that when they are booked. Got it. <laughs> Yeah, you could say that too. Absolutely. This is definitely a more concise way of putting it. All right. Last virus, multipartite. Um, let's see here. Melody, can you please read for us about a multipartite virus? Uh, it attacks your system in multiple ways. It may attempt to infect boot sector, all executable files, and destroy application files. Excellent. Thank you. Very short, very concise. 
multipartite. It is attacking you in multiple ways. It's not just trying to attack your program files. It's not just trying to attack your system files. It's not just trying to get into your boot sector. It's trying to hit you at multiple levels all at the same time. Questions, comments? For resident files, I mean, uh, resident virus, to get rid of that, would you have to just replace um, like the entire RAM module? Uh, no, you might you might need to do a system restore on this one. Because here's the thing is, is it's infecting everything. So it's like a full system restore. Okay, got it. And once you do that, that can clear out your RAM and clear everything up. So we'll get into uh, malware remediation. There's seven steps to malware remediation. Um, I don't know if they mention it in this one, but we do get into that in one of the next few technical sessions, I believe. Yes, Kali. Um, can you have like multiple virus, like in like affect your code, like at the same time, like let's say like, like mostly all those can be like on the computer at the same time. <laughs> can you have multiple types of viruses on your computer at the same time? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> It's not like you're like, oh, okay, I've only got one virus, but I got it out from the corner. I'm okay. No, no. You can get you can get multiple kinds. So that's Damn. a good question, though. I like that question. That is a good one. Yeah, because so, yes. then it's like this virus can be doing this, but another <coughs> one is doing that. And and mm -hmm. so you basically gotta just take the computer and throw it away. Like just... <laughs> no, there's there's steps we can take, there's things we can do to kind of remove this stuff. So um sure. we'll we will get into that, guys. Yeah, I think I'll be more interested in the malware protection and, and, and stuff like that. Okay. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> Rebecca, how can we help you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my question was that, can we remove it with the, uh, the antivirus work for all this? Not all of these, protection? but some of these. You know, a good okay. portion of these, yes. Um, but... The, the main thing we want the antivirus for, or you know, one of the other things that we want the antivirus for is to stop these files before they get to us, right? Oh. So that's why we have that definitions list is it's looking at programs that we're initiating, that we're installing, and it can go, oh, hold on. This, this looks like it is infected with a virus and it will give you that warning. Um, but Antivirus can remove many of these, but certain things like when we talked about, um, where is it here? Uh, sorry, I'm just gonna find it real quick. Here it is, like the phage virus. Um, so we can go through and use the antivirus and remove, say if we remove like 99% of it, we miss that 1%, it can start replicating from that 1%. So certain viruses are very dangerous, even with an antivirus trying to fight it. But yes, the antivirus is a powerful tool with regards to this. I like the virus that replicate the antivirus and use it to infect other stuff while the antivirus is trying to remove the virus. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, you know, unintentionally, the antivirus is actually infecting your entire system instead of you know, cleaning it up. Yeah, so you over here, you keep running it thinking you're doing something and you're just adding more viruses. <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, using gasoline to put out a brush fire. <laughs> so essentially. <Awesome. laughs> yes, Kevin. Um, yeah. Okay. So two things. One, um, we have, do we have to memorize like all these viruses? You need to have just, um, an idea like I, yes. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm trying to dance around it like, nah, I don't know about that. You know, like, but yeah, you do. Yeah, no, no. I just, okay. Just, just <laughs> so I know what I'm studying, doing. Yeah. Um, you know, the like, other thing, um, go ahead. Is that uh, um, uh, after lunch, I have uh, an appointment that um, I need to go to. So I, no problem. You know, just, all right. Thank you. We don't have a tea session for the afternoon. So, okay. All right. We, you know, we'll possibly have Coach Courtney. And if Coach Courtney's not here, I have a backup exercise for all of us. So, all righty. Uh, no worries. All right. Any other questions? Feeling warm and fuzzy yet? I don't know if that's the word I would use, but, you know, <laughs> getting there. Getting there? Yeah. All right. Well, we're done with talking about viruses, so we, we can move on to more, more pleasant subjects like worms. Um, main thing about worms there a worm is not a virus it is different one a worm can reproduce itself without interaction from the host so a worm self-replicates typically viruses still require action from us either opening up new files or you know causing things to happen to allow it to replicate through the system worms do not need that interaction. They can replicate themselves. They are self-contained. And they can utilize ways to transport themselves across your network from one system to another. So self-contained, reproduces itself, and doesn't need a host, applica host application to be transported. Three very important keys when you're talking about worms. However, you can use worms to deliver viruses. So you can have viruses embedded in the code of a worm. So this falls back to that. Can you have more than one infection at a time? Absolutely. So we can now take a worm and use that to deliver different kinds of viruses for us. So whatever services that they have access to and they can utilize to exploit, they will in the host system. Um, and then they will try to gain access to another system. Can a virus um, deliver a worm? Not typically. You wouldn't, I mean, the, the virus in and of itself is trying to destroy or manipulate or move files, you wouldn't use a virus as a delivery system. Oh, okay. okay. The virus itself is what you're trying to deliver. Oh, okay. Do the worm go on, um, I guess, infected device, just how like um, the virus will, like through emails and stuff? So it comes through, the worm comes through that also or by another way? It can come in through emails. It can, you know, kind of hitchhike under the programs. Um, it can travel on its own, like it can try to communicate with whatever machines are on the network that it can communicate with. It's going to try to gain access to it. So it uses pretty much any method at its disposal to try to get to other systems, replicate itself and move. That doesn't mean all worms are bad. Um, I'll talk about one here in just a second. So early worms filled up the memory inside and bred inside the RAM module of the targeted computer. And it would try to chew up the RAM as much as possible, utilize those resources as much as possible until the computer couldn't handle it and just crashed. So they can use TCP IP to deliver themselves. They can use email. So, um, have you ever heard of a case of somebody getting a virus and then all of a sudden, or they get some malware in their computer and all of a sudden the, their email sends out an email to everybody in their contacts list? Worms do that. 
They're trying to propagate and spread themselves. And also they'll send an email from you to like your mother and say, hey, mom, check out this video I found on YouTube. And then they click on it and the link actually infects them. And it'll still take them to some silly video, but their system is now infected and then it will go through all of their contacts, and try to spread that way. Damn. So, so only when you click on a link, right? Not open the email. It's only not, well, yeah. Opening the email itself doesn't necessarily infect you. It's typically a link or something okay. or a file inside the email. Okay. Yeah, and I definitely see how like they got all my information. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing is half the battle. Um, so there are good instances of worms. There was, uh, because interestingly, there has been some really cool innovations in the programming and computer industries that have come from viruses and worms. We learn how to manipulate systems in different ways. Uh, one worm that is particularly notorious in a good way is something called the tamarind worm, which when we were first switch, starting to switch over, from IP version four to IP version six, we had a problem where we couldn't push IP version six protocols across an IP version four network. So it created this weird bottleneck. Well, some hacker figured out a way to actually push IP version six protocols over an IP version four network. And it was called the Tamarin worm. And that led to what was called um, was it is six to four tunneling, which if any of you have played on PlayStation, like back in PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, you have utilized this particular technology because that is how their, um, their live multiplayer would be pushed over the IP version four networks. So they took a worm, which was destructive and bad, and they found a way to use that in current technology and make our technology more efficient because the hacker themselves figured out a way to more efficiently use protocols. Kind of cool, right? Mm, I guess it's I guess it's not the tool, it's just how you use it. So like anything, right? The tool itself yeah. is neither good nor bad. It's the method in which it is used. Right? Yeah, so that's actually, yeah, that's pretty good. So that are war, that's what worms are. Spyware. Some of the most common and notorious that we use or that are on our systems on any given day. So basically, what does a spyware do? Well, it's spying on you. It's monitoring what activity you do, and it's going to offer unsolicited pop-up advertisements known as adware. So you go to Lowe's and you check out you know the power tools they have over there and then you're like okay well i didn't find what i wanted and then you go over to head to home depot and while you're on home depot you're seeing banner ads for those very power tools you were looking at at lowe's and now all of a sudden they're 20 percent off so this is spyware they're looking at what you go they're they're monitoring where you go what you look at who you talk to who's in your contacts so that they can better advertise to you as a consumer. Sometimes it's big companies doing this. Sometimes it's shady companies doing this. Sometimes the big companies are the shady companies, <coughs> Google. And other times, you know, <laughs> it could just be small local companies wanting to do more target, targeted advertising. Yes, Kevin. Is this the reason why when I shop on Amazon, like I, I, I purchase something and then like not two seconds later, my Facebook feed is trying to show me all kinds of similar things. Yes. That's they, they uncomfortable. Follow you through cookies. So cookies, cookies is a spyware. Uh, it's a piece of it. Cookies are used for different types of things, but yeah, to a degree it's, it's meant to kind of, monitor you and your activities it can be used to identify you uh so there's various things that they use cookies for um but a lot of times what we may think of it's it's less intrusive but more scary when we start talking about certain things with them advertising specific things to you, it could be location services. Like they noticed that you went to Target and you spent a little bit of time around the 
uh, the target electronics area and you go home and now all of a sudden on Facebook and all that stuff, it's targeting or it's advertising you the very same TV you were looking at, but you were looking at that TV because it was the one that was on sale. So now what it is, is they basically utilize this algorithm saying, you know, okay, they spent some time in the electronics area, most likely because you're using the, the, uh, what was it? Cartwheel app for target. Um, so they noticed just where you were, you spent some time at this specific spot in the store, you must be interested in getting a new TV or something like that. So they'll start advertising the big sale items they have, which is likely the TV you were looking at. Man, the Amish lifestyle is starting to look more and more attractive. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking same going, you know, but they I mean, they use this in all manner of your behaviors your search algorithms and stuff like that there's a notorious case where uh, google knows when you search certain things and it's not even directly related stuff but when you search certain things they know that you're there's like a 90 percent likelihood that you're pregnant um so there's an old story where like and it could be something like oh i'm not feeling well today you know, and they're looking at historical trends of your searches. And there was a, a case where a, a father found out his teenage daughter was pregnant before she did because they started receiving advertisements for Gerber and all that stuff in the mail. Because she was searching for certain things. It wasn't necessarily, um, am I pregnant? What are signs of this? It was just certain key terms like my feet are swelling, my lower back is hurting um what could be causes for you know my stomach being upset and so you're, you're searching for these certain things not actually trying to activate it towards pregnancy but they're saying yep there's a 90 percent likelihood she's pregnant let's go ahead and send this and that's part of where spyware comes in it's monitoring these activities search histories where you go what you look at all that stuff and it's putting together packages they sell this data to advertisers to say hey we can be really effective and target our advertising towards this particular type of demographic for you. So, all right, how do we get spyware on our machines? Well, we ask for it. We go to websites and they say, hey, do you accept cookies? And everybody's like, oh, I like cookies. And we go ahead and we accept it. And then uh, we now have somebody following us along wherever we go. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to self-replicate like a virus or a worm. It is spread by us basically saying, yeah, we're cool with that. Go ahead and give us that. <clears throat> Remember the, the mantra we said at the beginning of this class, when something is free, you're the product. So when you when you're Second, utilizing- I was just about to say, <laughs> to say that, that I remember when we started, you said that. Yeah, that, you know, when something is free, you are the product and you just said it. <laughs> yep. So when something is free, you're the product. They're mining the data they get from you. And that's how they make their money, because they're able to sell targeted advertisements to you because they know what you like. They're able to sell that data to other companies. They're able to monitor your behaviors and sell that to even more companies to say, hey, people who exhibit these behaviors tend to believe these certain things or like these types of products. And it is a huge industry. Why do you think Facebook? Huh? Now I'll say I need to get paid for that because if that's using my 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 data to like sell off, I need to get a percentage of that. There you go. <laughs> well, that's why a lot of these, a lot of these companies are hating the fact that the majority of people are starting to use things like VPNs, encryption, and all that stuff because it is hampering and slowing down their ability to mine this data. Mr. So, Kelly, that's I had a good question. Does incognito mode matter or not really? Okay, so incognito matters in some ways, not in others. So incognito mode, basically, it doesn't save your search history or uh, whatever for websites. So like if you're looking for presence for your significant other on Amazon or Google or whatever, it's not going to save that search history for that time. However, your ISP and places like Google are still monitoring that because that data is still open. Remember, we had a conversation early on in the cohort where I said um, there have been legal cases in the last few months that have come out that basically state if you make zero attempt, if you're making no attempts to obscure your data, 
then you have no right to privacy. So they don't need to get a warrant or anything like that. They can literally just go to your internet service provider and say, yeah, give us their internet history for the last six months. And the internet service provider is like, yeah, sure, no problem. Here you go. Um, so the Kelly, can you like deny cookies and still access a site or do you have to accept cookies in order to access like some sites depends on the site all righty some some sites make it a hard stop some sites you know it's kind of take it or leave it yeah because now now i don't want to accept cookies on anything <laughs> one good practice you can get into is like wiping out the cookies on your machine a couple times a week that limits the amount of spying they're able to do all righty because I was going to say that happened to me when I first started this class and I learned, I started reading about it and some of the site I'll go on and they'll force you. They'll say, you know, if you don't use the cookie, you can't accept, you can't like use the website. So yep. they kind of force you to take to like accept the cookies. Yeah. Um, also, like, like that's through you, you wipe the cookies through the browser, right? Like that's. Or, or is there a control panel setting for that? I uh, believe it's done through the browsers. So oh, it's gotcha. each individual browser you need to go through and do this. Yeah, but yeah. some and I'm, and I malware programs and stuff like that will automatically clean them for you. Okay. You have a cool feature in malware bytes that um it has a um cookie stashing. So basically it tricks the site into thinking that you've accepted the cookies and it's just stashing it one place and as soon as you leave that page or it, you know you just basically close your browser, it just cleans that out for you. Uh, nice. it, that's it, malware bytes. Yeah, Mal yeah, Malwarebytes is really good, man. It's nice. it's, it's uh, making its rounds in um, Palo Alto um, over at that side. Okay. It's, it's, it's a big deal in the um, server industry. Nice. Let's check on that. Piehole, okay. All right, so... How does it spread? Well, you, get, you download it through other programs, you let it in the front door, uh, you visit infected sites, and there's a multitude of other ways that spyware gets in. Some of it's legitimate, some of it's not, but it's there. Onward to the Trojans. How many saw the movie Troy? Am I the only one? Eric Bana, oh, I, I, never, I never saw the movie, but I, I know history class. <laughs> okay, so you, really so, you, so you read the you read you read the Iliad. All right, so <laughs> so history class. So essentially, it's the same thing. Um, you know, spoilers for those who haven't watched. Uh, they build. You know, once the when the uh, the Greeks were leaving Troy, they built this giant horse. As, you know, they, they feigned like they were leaving. They weren't actually leaving. They built this giant horse uh, and left it as a offering to the gods. And the, the Trojans, when they saw it, they're like, yeah, well, you know, it's an offering to the gods, so we can't destroy it. We have to take it to the temple. So they brought it into the gates uh, of the city. And there was a bunch of uh, soldiers hiding inside the horse. And they waited until nighttime. Everybody was asleep, celebrating that they won the war. The Trojans came, or the Greeks came out of the, uh, the horse went and opened the gates and basically bypassed all the defenses because the Trojans themselves brought that into their own house, essentially. Same thing here. Uh, it, is, it creates a back door um, and or it will replace a valid program during installation. So it can kind of call home. It, it sneaks in under the guise of something else. So you think you're downloading an antivirus program and you're basically loading a Trojan horse onto your system. Um, so they can use to be to compromise security systems. A lot of them have built in like phone home protocols. Greg and I were talking about this yesterday. So once the program is installed, it's sending a beacon call back to its home base to let them know, hey, I'm, you know, we're open for business. And by doing that, that kind of bypasses that stateful firewall. Remember, that's the one that pays attention to the, the state of the conversation and that it has to start from inside the firewall. So if the protocol or the, the, the Trojan has a protocol in it to call home past the firewall, it's now bypassed the security of that firewall because the state of the conversation has begun from inside 
the Trojan horse behind the firewall. So it sends a call home. And then when the, the home base or the, the hacker or so that is receiving that phone call can now come in bypassing security because the stateful firewall will let it in thinking it was initiated from the original user. But it typically gets in attached to or under the guise that it's another type of program. So one way that you can kind of reveal you have a Trojan is by doing something called a port scan. So you can see what kind of communications are happening on your ports uh, through your system. If you have certain programs that are talking on ports they shouldn't be talking in, that's an indication of a Trojan horse. Questions so far? You guys are looking more worried the further, the longer I talk. Just saying. Any questions so far? Are we doing okay? Pulse check. Sorry, can you? Uh, I kind of missed it. The I was using a bathroom. No problem. Uh, Trojans? About Trojans, yes. It's like the Trojan horse from Greek mythology where they, they snuck the soldiers into Troy. Oh. So this, this uh, kind of sneaks a bad program into your system pretending like it's something else. Oh, okay. This, this is another virus anyways. Not a virus. It's a Trojan. It's different than a virus. Oh, okay. It's another type of malware, yes. So, yes. All right. Next. So, I'm sorry. What was the last thing you said about Trojan when you just said it? You said that, um, I'm sorry, the last sentence when you said it, like, I missed that. You said but the port, what about the port scanning? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, that's what you were saying. You said the port so that's scan. one way to detect a Trojan. You can do a port scan and say, I have a web server that's supposed to be talking on either port 443 or port 80. But if I look and I do a port scan and my web server is all, all of a sudden talking on port 2783, that's, that's not right. It shouldn't be communicating over there. So something is telling it to communicate on this other port rather than the main one. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. So that's why ports are important to know what they are. You know, you want to make sure protocols are only communicating over the ports that they're supposed to. Got it. All right. Most of the time, yes, Oscar. All right. So, rootkits. How many of you ever downloaded and played a fun game called Valorant? Anybody out there ever play that? It's a free game. You can download all that kind of cool stuff. Right. Huh? Oh, you did it. it. You hated it. I, I, I personally don't like Valorant. My girlfriend. Okay. Does, but, he uh, didn't like it. Kevin did. Anybody else download and play it? No. No? Okay. Well, it's good because it was a root kit. Valorant downloads itself all the way down to the kernel level of your computer. They do this under the guise of um, anti-cheat mechanisms. But this program literally embeds itself all the way down to the kernel. These are software programs that have the ability to hide certain things that they're doing. Uh, Valorant all of a sudden has uh, well, basically unfettered access to your computer. And when you download it, it asks you for the administrative password. Do you want to download this game? You give it the administrative password. It says, okay, thank you, and downloads all the way down to the kernel. So every level of your computer. Um, so with this, there may be a number of programs on the system that, you, that don't show up in your task manager. So they can basically say, no, we don't, wanna, we don't want this to show up. Um, 
With that, they may be able to establish connections that don't appear in NetStat. So you can't even look and see if they're making a connection because they can say, yeah, we don't want this to appear. It, you know, the rootkits do this by manipulating functions and or function calls and basically filtering out any information it does not want you to see. So being, le being leery of free programs. Yeah, Valorant was determined to be a rootkit. Uh, I oh, is believe- this on my system now? Huh? So it's just, this just on my system now? Like I haven't uh, uninstalled it yet or anything. I just haven't played it. It's there. So there's no way to get that off? Yeah. Uh-uh. <laughs> By resetting the entire computer. <laughs> Um, you may not have to go that extreme, but you may. Uh, but yeah, basically that has created essentially a level of spyware that is on your system and they have basically uh, deep access to your systems. That is, wow. Wow, just one friend suggestion said, hey, get this, <laughs> wow. I'm gonna kill him. <laughs> <laughs> so now it has not been determined whether Valorant is, I mean, has been used for nefarious means However, the program itself is a rootkit. It's going all the way down to the kernel. Yeah, but then the thing is, like, then years from now, like, it could come out like, hey, it's been doing this the whole time. That's possible, yeah. I'm just <laughs> like, oh, all right. This is a stressful day for many people. I apologize. Yes, I'm not the only, I'm not the only one now. <laughs> all right, so... Funny, but. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of one of those things, like it's a learning process. We make mistakes. We do things that we don't realize can, can cause problems. And that's why we're here, right? We're here to learn. I have made many of these mistakes. So we just learn for going forward uh, so we can Thank make God better for decisions. This tea session. You what? Thank God for this tea session because I, I, I'm going to now tonight probably go do a hundred things that I wasn't doing before. <laughs> and don't worry, we have like five or six more security sessions after this one to go through too. So it's a fun week. Um, but the process, you know, we're trying to get a high level understanding of it, be able to look at some of the warning signs, start learning how to remediate these things so that we can better help others, right? And that's, that's the whole purpose of what we're doing. So it does happen. Again, I've been a victim of it myself. And we just try to learn from what's happened in the past, understand why it's happening, and try to prevent it going forward. Uh, preventing rootkits. Unfortunately, many um, are written to get around antiviruses. So antiviruses aren't really going to pick them up. And you need to make sure your anti-spyware stuff is kept up to date. So even if you do have one, it can kind of mitigate some of the effects of this rootkit. Um, best defense is to kind of monitor what your systems are doing and try to catch the rootkit in the process of installation because some of them are a little more open with it. Some of them are more nefarious. Again, Valorant, though it is a rootkit, tends to be a little more benign so far. It's been determined that way. All right. Questions, comments, concerns. Can rootkits be in applications? Like, you know, if you go on like, um, like, what is that called? The Apple store, would it be in applications or would you have to like download it from like a different source and then it comes? Uh, that's kind of a, I mean, it's kind of a loaded question. Apple is one of those companies that is extremely paranoid about the stuff it lets on their store for the most part. So the likelihood of downloading a rootkit on, from the Apple store is extremely rare um, for, from like a bad actor. However, if, you're, if you've jailbroken your iPhone and you're sideloading applications on your, your phone without not going through the Apple store, yeah, there is a good likelihood you're getting some kind of malware along with whatever program you're installing. So my question is like with the root key, when you said it actually for like the administrative password, so it's mm -hmm. not your system, 
Because sometimes you know how you download something on your system and it, it just asks you that, like saying, yeah. hey, would you like to download this? So it's not your system asking you for the password. No, it's it is your exactly system asking you for that password. It says, hey, you're downloading this program. Are you sure you want to do this? And making sure that somebody who's not administrative level can't do that, it asks for that administrative password. Once you do that, you're granting it the access to download wherever it says it wants to go. Oh, so then whenever your system asks you something like that, you should take that as like a like a warning then just like not necessarily almost most programs when you download them are going to ask for that administrative password. But what I'm saying is, is when you put it in, you're granting the access to that program. So I would only do that with programs I trust. Um, you know, that come from what are called secure foundries, places that you trust, like the App Store is generally a good, a good place to trust. The Google Play Store is generally a good place to trust. Uh, Bob's website for free movies, probably not. Okay. <laughs> Got it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those, like, in general, do you trust where you're receiving the information from? Got it. Okay. All right, ransomware. This is a fun one. Basically, this is a type of malware that goes on and encrypts your entire drive. So it basically makes everything unusable, unreadable. And the hacker basically comes in and says, hey, I'm sorry to hear your system is encrypted. If you just give me $2,000 worth of Amazon gift cards, I will unlock the system for you. So they try to hold your data essentially for ransom, requiring you to make a payment in order to get that information uh, released. Um, the good news with regards to ransomware is if you pay the ransom, you have like a 99% chance of getting all your data back because they don't want it getting out there that if somebody paid and didn't get their information, because then nobody will pay, right? So that's the general premise. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, it's sad to say, but it's like an honor among thieves thing. So once they've locked up your systems and you pay, they generally, you know, almost always release it at that point because, you know, they want the next person to pay. My friend just paid like $100 for ransomware. It's, it's nasty stuff. There um, is a workaround though. Is there a government department that has the infrastructure to track down these activities, these, these scamming, uh, hacking activities? I would say yes and no. Um, unlike, you know, here's the, here's the general rule. Um, if you're a government employee, how much do you think you make? Probably like 30, uh, 40,000. Yeah, average. If you're a high level employee, you're probably making close to six figures, right? Oh, yeah, I, I, yeah I, about that. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're if you're really, you know, really a top level employee, you're making close to six figures, right? How much do you think a Google programmer makes? Almost twice that. See, sixty grand a year. I would say a multiple of that. Wow. They're probably making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, depending on their skill level maybe more. Mm -hmm. So where do the best programmers in the country go? Do you think they go to the government? Do you think they go to Google? Yeah, they'll, they'll most likely go to Google. There you go. You go to other countries, it's the opposite. You go to places like Estonia, Russia, China, the best hackers get paid the most by the government, not by the private organizations. Makes sense. So that's the, that's the debate. So typically the ones who are working for the government willing to work for hundred thousand dollars are the ones who got caught. <laughs> and, you know, they say you can go to prison for five years or you can work for us for five years. So you have those typically working. So that's generally my argument on it. Is that the case? I cannot say for hundred percent certain, but that's my personal view on it. Is that really a thing? Like that they give you an ultimatum, like you can go to, federal prison or you can or you can work for us our government would never do something like that just watch a movie called catch me if you can wow okay 
Yeah, that's right. It says save, <laughs> save for the we device. We be here you, Mr. Kelly. <laughs> no, so, our, okay. our government never. <laughs> So there's a there's a true movie about it was about check fraud it had Leonardo DiCaprio back of you know a little while ago it was, it was a true story called Catch Me If You Can about this con artist who figured out the banking system manipulated it for his own means all that stuff and ended up he got caught and basically his option was he can go work for the government for X many years or he can go to federal prison he decided to go work for the government work through his term and then now he's a uh, consultant for the government so he makes a lot more now but. Originally, you know, it's basically you could either go to prison or work for us. So, ransomware, that's that's kind of what it does. The the fun thing about it is, is if you actually keep regular backups, um, so like you, you, you have good incremental and, you know, you have a good backup schedule and you keep good control of your data and, and back it up a lot. If they come and they say, give me $2,000 or I'm not going to free up your data, you can say, you know, kick rocks. I'm not giving you the money. You shut down your system, you reboot from backups and you don't have the ransomware there anymore. You may All have right. lost a couple hours of work, but you're not out too grim. Right, so, where I Here's where I jump in. Not foolproof, man. I've, I've been uh, I've been on the other side of a few ransomware attacks because of uh, work at an MSP. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things about the backup solution, backup and restore solution, there is a zero day attack in some of these ransomware. Uh, so basically they have a deadline in some of those ransomware attacks mm -hmm. where they say that I come in in 2019, install my ransomware. Right, you know, it's, it's on your system. You have no idea it's there, but on, in 2021, it will that will be the deadline when this when, when this attack launches. Right, you will okay. see it um, on January 1st, 2021. Okay. Now you go back and say, okay, you know what? Screw you! I'm not going to pay. Sorry, um, I'm not going to pay you, which one company didn't. Um, and you go back to your backups. Mm -hmm. install your backups but because of the zero day attack they basically are now it's it reactivates right away immediately okay. so every single time you go to a, the oldest backup you can find you it's still there you know and you, so no matter what you do is you still, so it has a sleeper mode essentially on it exactly so it's okay. zero day and you will just basically whatever that day comes d day comes Mm -hmm. It will just launch no matter what you do. So if you, as long as you, the only way you can actually um, go around this attack is basically setting all machines um, to the days days before that day attack, right? So if you say, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to do a backup a restore, I'm going to restore um, from a backup, I should say, and you you set like an um, isolated machine to a date in 2018, then you can actually manipulate the data. But it's yeah, it, it's yeah, it's crazy. So there's a few extra steps, but yeah. No, but still, it screws you because uh, at the end of the day, you still have to pay them. In some of those cases, you still have to pay those guys because True. as soon as if you don't do it that way, all right. So a lot of a lot of a lot of people or companies, I should say, um, when they get attacked by ransomware, it replicates the other portions or other parts of your 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 system. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't if you don't have firewalls in between departments and firewalls in between servers and it just yeah. it just gets really complicated. So I, well, I mean, now in this particular case, sorry, I was just speaking more in a personal sense, but yeah. Oh, okay. On an enterprise level, yeah, it's going to be a significantly more. Specific. It's crazy. Yeah. So now you go ahead and say, all right, I'm going to do all this cleaning, and then this one machine in accounting, you know, what I mean, can just you know hold it, okay. start this whole thing over. So it's, it's rough, man. Around somewhere, oh, it's a nasty, nice. stuff. nasty stuff. I did not know that on the enterprise level. Thank you for that. I, re I, did, I was not fully aware of that. I was speaking more on the personal level because usually it's not going to be that sophisticated on the personal level. Um, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Paid, not, paid. I mean, not in a good way, but like, wow. <laughs> uh -huh. One company, and really, it was a nonprofit too. They paid $150,000 uh, after <laughs> you know not trying to pay mm -hmm. for at least three weeks, three weeks, almost a month. Yeah. Yeah, it was rough, man. Because well, yeah, I guess it would be one of those like, no, you you weren't nice to us before. Now the price has gone up. They wanted four million. Oh wow, <laughs> that was their original ask because of the size of the company. But you know, after 
you know, a lawyer got involved and all sorts of stuff. They just say, hey, look, just pay it. We'll take it from insurance. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. But yeah, I did not, uh, did not know that about the, the uh, enterprise. Level. Thank you for that. So, okay. So in a nutshell, ransomware encrypts your data and they demand money to unencrypt it. All right. Now for the biggest risk to most companies, social engineering. Um, let's see here. Kevin, can you read for us, please? <clears throat> the whole thing? Uh, just down to the types. Okay. Social engineering. Social engineering is a process in which an attacker attempts to acquire information about the network and system by social means, such as by talking to people in the organization. A social engineering attack may occur over the phone, by email, or a visit. Uh, the intent is to acquire access information such as user IDs and passwords when the attempt is made through email or instant messaging is known as phishing, discussed in next slide, and often is made to look as if it is coming from sites where users are likely to have accounts. Um, I would like to just, is, is this kind of like, because I know that there are like phone scams where like they'll call you and they attempt mm -hmm. to get you to say the word yes. Yeah. And like they record you and like they they record your name and stuff like that kind of you know that's that's you know they're they're trying to set up an impersonation scam where they can go and, and basically create yeah. a recording um and basically make it seem like you've agreed to all the terms and stuff like that so yeah like they, they try to get like your bank account information they try to make it seem like mm -hmm. oh is this for like insurance or something and then they record like you saying stuff and then yeah. they use that information to get into your accounts Oh yeah, there's there's different ways, and and they also use social engineering aspects to bypass multi-factor authentication. I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Oh wow! So, um, different types that we need to be concerned about in general. You have uh, phishing, which is kind of over email and instant message, like I said, where they're kind of impersonating someone else, trying to get you to provide them with. Um, uh, important information. Um, the other thing is spoofing, which is where you might call and impersonate somebody else. So like you might call, you can, you know, spoof the phone number of that. So it looks like it's an internal phone call. Call up somebody in the office and say, hey, I'm with IT. We're looking to upgrade your system later today. Um, I don't want to bother you with it during the day because it could cause about an hour or two of downtime. Um, I was wondering if you could possibly give me your sign in and password uh, to get into your systems later so that we don't have to bother you with it and we don't have to do this while you're working. And they'll be like, oh, OK, you know, just in case. Yeah, and they'll give you the sign in and password, which IT should never ask for that information. But the average person may not know that. So they'll call and they'll request that information pretending to be IT, hoping you will give it to them. So that would be kind of spoofing. Shoulder surfing is what it says it is. It's basically somebody kind of hanging out, staring over your shoulder, hoping to catch you putting in uh, your passcodes, your, your sign-ins, any of that stuff. You know, they try doing that at ATMs where they'll try to shoulder surf and catch you putting in your, um, your PIN number. And then as you're leaving, they'll try to lift your wallet or something like that where you wouldn't notice. And then they'll go back and get as much money as they can. So... Um, it's basically somebody just trying to stare over your shoulder and catch the information that you're putting in as you're putting it in. That is shoulder surfing. Um, and then tailgating, that's basically like if you have a secure building where you have to use access cards or guards or something like that, and there's some security checkpoint, somebody may try to come up behind you and, oh wait, hold the door for me. And then you hold the door for them and you have now allowed them to bypass security. Uh, one method they may use to do this is they'll 
pretend to look like a delivery person. They'll act like they're part of that building and they'll come up and they'll look like they're struggling with five or six boxes. And you don't want to be the jerk to close the door in someone's face if they're carrying a bunch of heavy boxes, right? So you do the right thing as social uh, norms dictate. And you hear, let me hold that door for you. It looks like that's heavy. Allowing them to walk right past your security measures. So that's tailgating. But we're going to talk no, about we're that. Gonna go on. Yeah, I didn't know we were going to go into physical realm. Okay, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we get into the physical realm here. All right, fishing. So this is basically... Um, you're trying to get information from them, either through email or IMs or something like that. So there's a piece of a puzzle that you're missing in order to kind of get their administrator or their level of access. So you're trying to use these phishing emails or whatever to try to get that information to access those accounts. Like we talked about with those surveys. Hey, find out what house of, of Hogwarts you would fall into. What's your, what's your first pet's name? What street did you live on when you were a child? What was your first elementary? You know, so they'll, they'll ask you all of these things. What was the mascot at your high school? And you fill out all this information. And that, that ironically is the answer to a lot of the challenge questions you would get when trying to log into your account if you needed to reset the password. So that's something that the email is trying to get. It's going to most likely try to look as it's from a legitimate source. There could be, if you ever received an email from a bank you had no relationship with, and you're like, hey, Bank of America, your, your account has been compromised. Please click the hyperlink and change your account password so that, um, you know, your, you, you know your, sister, your account is more secure. Phishing. Their hope, you know, you, maybe you don't have the Bank of America account, but the 50,000 other people that they sent it to might. So they're fishing, they're throwing, they're casting a wide net, trying to catch some people if they can. Um, so the, basically the preventative measures you have in dealing with this is try to use you know, some common sense, but also educating the end users, what to look for. You um, never give out IDs or passwords over the phone via email. And to anyone who is not positively identified, I would say don't even give them to your managers. Because there should be no reason why your manager needs your sign in and password. So, and there are different types of phishing scams we can use as well. There's one that's called spear phishing, and there's one that's called whaling. Spear phishing is like, you're trying to bypass the security at X corporation. That specific corporation is when you're targeting. So you're sending emails to everybody you can find at that specific organization. You're not broadly just sending it out to everybody. You're looking to get into that very specific organization. So it's more targeted, spear phishing. And then you have something that's called whaling, which is where, you know, like you ever heard somebody like, oh, I landed a whale, which is like a really big sale or, you know, a really big score on a movie or something like that. Whaling is specifically targeting executives at, at whatever companies. So you're, you're looking for the big fish or the whales. All right. Spoofing. This is essentially the process of masquerading as someone else. Hi, I'm with, I am Bob from IT. You know, we're, we need, we're, Going through and going through the process of updating uh, all the systems in the company. So they would usually do this with um, the purpose of trying to gain additional resources. So one instance may be that they're they're contacting you, saying, you know, hi, I am you know Dave Smith, and you know Dave Smith is the chief information officer at the company say hey it's dave smith i got a marketing meeting later today i need these particular pieces of information i need you to send it to me right away i can't be on the phone too long and you're like i'm not gonna you know violate the orders of an executive of the company so he's pretending to be that person trying to get you to send them critical information Another way they may try to do this to bypass 
security measures electronically is spoofing IP addresses and MAC addresses. Remember we talked about MAC filtering and how I said it was kind of a security measure, but not really. Well, if you can figure out the MAC address of one of the computers on the system, you can spoof that MAC address and use it to bypass the MAC filtering mechanism. And then the system will think you're this other computer. So you've essentially spoofed it. You're pretending to be another system. You can do the same thing with IP addresses. Usernames and passwords, once you have that. If I have Oscar's username and password for the company, I can sit there and start doing things like sending emails, making requests. If he works in accounting, I can approve payments. I can do any, you know, a lot of different stuff. And all of that will fall back on Oscar. And they'll say, well, hey, you signed in and put your password in. You authorize this. So I'm pretending to be him because I have his credentials. Or if you have another, you know, you want to infect the system with a virus or a worm. If I have access to Oscar's email, I can plant that virus in a worm, send it out saying, here is the new updated protocols for IT for the next quarter. Please read them as we will be discussing them in our um, workshop we're doing later today. Everybody sees it's from Oscar's like, hey, Oscar's the manager of IT. Obviously, this must be important. So they'll open up and read said document in so doing, infecting almost everybody in the company. So in, in that case, like, is that something that like, like something like SMIME would be useful for? Well, SMIME would be, I mean, SMIME would not actually be useful for this because if I have your credentials, I now have access to your system, right? Yeah, that's true. So then I can utilize those encryption credentials. So this actually bypasses SMIME. Gotcha. So I have, I have literally gone past one of the measures that you already had in place, and then I'm able to send it with the wonderful certificate, you know, using the certificates and all that kind of fun stuff that they um, would be expecting to see on the other end. They see that and they're like, yep, I know it came from Oscar. Must be a good document. Open it up. And now they're infected. Okay, so something like a like a hardware key, like a USB key, like Fido would be useful if you want. Yes. Like, yeah. Okay, that's what I use. Gotcha. Yes, Kali. So, like, once they get to that point, like, like for the other people on the other hand, like the other end, like, there's nothing you can do about that because then you receiving an email from like a person from that you know company like you wouldn't really know that's spoofing or phishing or anything because like, well if it's somebody who you normally wouldn't hear from on a regular basis then maybe it's not something you would open yeah because like you said you said like let's say they say oh yeah this is like you know the head of it guys and we're doing our quarterly you yeah. know maintenance and you know it's a quarterly so it's not like you know, I, you know, I guess but, like you wouldn't really think about it. Like what if it's something that's never been done before? Like you don't normally have quarterly meetings. Now is that they're all of a sudden talking about quarterly meetings, something yeah. you may need to verify. Why would, if I am a lowly operations employee, why would the chief information officer be calling me? Why wouldn't they be calling my manager? Right. Right. Makes sense. Um, when you're receiving these emails, there's things you would look for, like sometimes they'll misspell the company name, the company logo doesn't look right. The, um, you know, so this email that's been generated, there's typos in that. Unfortunately, that wouldn't work if it comes from me. I do typos all the time. It's part of my chart. Um, but, you know, typically in a professional setting, you know, somebody's done spell check, you know, the document is more of a form letter, especially if it's going out to the entire organization. If you're seeing a form letter going out to the whole organization and there's typos and, and the logo is not right and all that stuff, that should red, red flag you right there. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was killing my company with those, man, because they used to send me a lot and I was just open them. I didn't even care. I was just like... <laughs> Not my system. <laughs> I do honestly. That's <laughs> that's what I, I just like open. I'm like, oh, they're paying somebody to. And you know, when you're in IT, those. you're going to be banging your head against the wall because that is going to be the the mentality of frontline employees at your company. Not my not my system. And yeah, it's going to be a whole lot of extra work for you. Huh? Yeah, I got to be leaving that karma is coming. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
<laughs> kind of continuing on, I know we're getting close to lunch here. Um, so shoulder surfing, we talked about this. This is kind of where they kind of hang out, look over your shoulders and stuff like that. This could be people you know. If somebody's going to be performing espionage at the company and try to get uh, like confidential documents or research material, any of that stuff out of the company, if they're going to send it out, they don't want to send it out under their name. They might go to jail. So they're going to be shoulder surfing and looking for your credentials so that they can send it out under your name. So even if they work for the company, there's somebody you talk to every day. This is still somebody you want to not, you don't want people looking over your shoulder when you're putting in your passwords. Because part of how this stuff is effective is they're going based off trust. We want to believe people are good. We want to believe people will do the right thing. The majority of the time that's true, but bad actors rely upon that trust in order to get past your systems. So best defense against shoulder surfing. You know, if you see somebody looking at me, you're like, hey, do you mind turning around for a minute? I gotta put in my passwords. Because they'll watch your hands, they'll watch what you put on the screen. Other things that can be used for people who are standing back a little bit further, especially if you're in an open air place, like, you know, Starbucks. Please try not to check your bank account at Starbucks. <laughs> uh, privacy filters. So, you know, privacy filters is almost like that IPS, the in-plane switching, where if you're standing right in front of it, or excuse me, twisted pneumatic, if you're standing right in front of it, it's clear. You step off just a little bit off angle and everything goes black and you can't see anything on the screen. That's what a privacy filter does. They have them, they make them for phones. So if you put one on your phone, if your phone is slightly off angle, if somebody's trying to stand next to you and look and see what you're typing or your bank account and all that stuff, they can't see it, you know, but you're able to see it when you're straight on it. So, you know, it's another way you can protect your, your data on your phones as well. Tailgating, we did talk about this before, you know, they're relying upon the, the kindness of others. Uh, you know, hey, hold the door for me, or, you know, like, you look like you're carrying heavy boxes or something like that, move behind you. You need to educate your users, you know, like, yes, we understand this may be doing the right thing, but no, you know, we need to make sure the protocols are in place. If it's a pizza delivery and it's going up to the third floor, I'm sorry, sir, you're going to have to wait out here and call the person that ordered it on the third floor so they can come down and let you in. I can't verify that you were the person or that they called you. You know, you kind of got to be a little bit of a jerk. But you have to educate your employees the same, you know, because it doesn't matter how big your walls are. If, if you open the gate and let them in, they're still in. Right. And one of the one of the integral rules of cybersecurity, if they have physical access to your systems, they own them. Doesn't matter what protocols you have in place, if they can physically get to your systems, they own your systems. So physical precautions or physical barriers are very important. Golly, we put in this section just for you. Password attacks. So we'll talk about strong passwords and things like that. Uh, how do they get past them? Um, if you're using the same password over and over and over again, please stop doing this. Uh, cause it's one of those things. Once they know your password to your email or your Amazon account or your, you know, Slack account, they say, Hey, this person may use the exact same password for their bank account. And so once they have one, they test it against everything else that you touch because people have a tendency to repeat passwords. We have certain applications we can use to get that initial password bypassed. And they have applications that are known as password crackers. <clears throat> and they use these to try to gain access to your systems. The most common types, there's four basic types you can use. There's one which is called a brute force, one called a dictionary attack, one that's called rainbow tables, and a hybrid attack. So the four main password attacks that you will typically see. 
Uh, brute force is essentially using an algorithm. They're going to be testing that password over and over and over again. So they're going to be going like if it was a, a four character password, they're going to go zero, 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 one. 0002 and they're going to go through these algorithms and hit that password as many times as they can until they guess the right one that is brute force so they're quite literally just you know randomly hitting as many passwords as they can um you have two types of brute force attacks you have online and offline online tends to be less effective nowadays because as as you have probably experienced some time in your life and you forget your password you try to put it in three times and then it locks you out right you ever had that happen that's a way to prevent an online brute force attack so it slows them down but if they don't have those measures in place they can keep trying the password tens of thousands of times until they hit the right ones and then they have access but typically nowadays most people most systems have that measure in place where you only have so many attempts and then you have to verify who you are to be able to bypass now the other way is yes golly i was gonna say for the for the for the password um if you use the same password for like multiple things as long as as long as it's complicated like it still should work right but the problem is, is if one of your passwords gets compromised, now all of them are. Okay. okay. Because you're using the exact same password each time. Got it. Don't worry. Don't worry, Golly. We're, we're gonna we're gonna work on this. <laughs> um, so there is a password, an offline attack. Because any system where you have to gain access they have to have a file of the passwords right so they know if you got it right but we don't transmit passwords over the over the open airs so like when i sign into amazon if my password is you know super awesome 124 that's not what Amazon sees. What happens is, is it creates that hash algorithm. Remember we talked about that where, it, you know, it does that one way encryption and it basically, you know, like I could use that book, the 10,000 page book, and it gives me this, this little series of random numbers and letters. But if I change one little thing, it will change that whole hash algorithm. So what's happening is, is I put in my sign in and password that then there's an, an algorithm that that company is, it creates a hash. That hash is sent over the airways and that's what's stored in their password file. So if you get their password file, you find a way to get in and you access that, it will give you a list of all these hashes and then you can kind of reverse engineer it. You can continually put in passwords against that hash and see what generates that code. And once you've seen what generates that code, you're now able to know I would, I now know what the password is and I can enter it in and get through that system. So that's what an offline attack is essentially is they're looking at the file and they're trying to, you know, use passwords against that file. But since it's offline, because they stole the file, they can do it hundreds of thousands of times until they get it right. So this will be something that would be running automatically. They would have a, a password cracker that would be working to bypass this. Questions on a on a brute force attack. Nope. All right. Dictionary attack. So hackers love to share dictionaries because some of them are more effective than others. Most people, when they're generating passwords, they're using common words or names. So you can have dictionaries for specific people if you wish. Like if I know who your parents are, who your kids, kids' names are, what their birthdays are and all that stuff, I can sit there and create a dictionary for you that it will try a variety or a amalgamation of all these different things. And likely your password will be something along those lines. So 
the dictionary attack basically has all common words in most in like all known languages. So it doesn't matter if you're using a different language. And it's going to try those first rather than just randomly submitting characters. And again, much like a brute force, this is this these attacks are typically done offline using the password file trying to match that hash or that encryption algorithm. Questions so far? Brute force is pretty much just random numbers and characters. Dictionary is a little more targeted using um, common words, names, phrases, things like that. All right, rainbow table. This is essentially already done through the hashing program. They have tables of all the most common hashes and how to get them. Some hashing algorithms are more complex than others. Um, so when they see certain hashes, especially in older systems, they can cross-reference that with some of the most common and say, okay, here's that hash. I know this is the password that goes with that hash. Here's, you know, so you can go ahead and use that. So that is a rainbow table, most common passwords and, and um, variations of them. <clears throat> so like we said earlier, when they're stored in a system, they're stored in a hashed format. So even if somebody was looking at that, password file, they wouldn't know what they were looking at because it's just a bunch of random letters, numbers, and symbols. Um, once you have access to this, you can utilize rainbow tables to work backwards and figure out what the passwords are. Quick, quick question before you move on to far here. Um, the offline yes. attack and the, the rainbow attack, how are they different again? Sorry, I, I was, I was well, walking around. So the, the, off, the offline attack is using a brute force approach where it's just sitting there and just keeps hammering away at it, trying to get that hash. The rainbow table is like a dictionary of hashes. So where this, where the, the dictionary is just common words that people use. And the brute force is just random letters and numbers, right? Mm -hmm. But it's repeatedly hitting it. The rainbow table is the most common hashes, like the most common passwords in hash format. Okay, so it's pretty much sim it's a cross between the first well, it's and the it's working, second. It's working backwards. Mm -hmm. Rather than me continually mm -hmm. putting in the passwords trying to get the hash, yeah. this is a list of common hashes that I can see backwards what the password is. Okay, fair enough. So it's just it's just a slightly different way of looking at it. And then the hybrid is typically a combination of dictionary and brute force where you're using that constant repetitive attack, but you're mostly focusing it on common words, phrases, replacing letters with numbers, like taking an S and replacing it with a five or a one and replacing it with, or an I replacing it with a one or something like that. So it uses common um, replacements with the words. We used to call it elite speak back in the day and it was L33T or 733T, excuse me. That's what Kali version one does, yeah. Yeah. So that is a hybrid attack. It is a mix of the first two. All right. I think we're gonna pause it right here. I know we only got about a few more slides. Continuing on, we, we talked about password hacks, we talked about worms, we talked about viruses, a um, couple other things. Now we gotta talk about zombies and bots, botnets, fun stuff. So there are people out there that try to get software installed upon computers. Any, you know, your computers are, or what have you, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get as many computers together as they can. And they affectionately refer to these people as farmers. 
They are creating entire botnets or farms of bots. We're talking about computers that are like, like tens of thousands of computers working together. And then once this, this software is installed, they can use that connection you have to that computer to make that computer do something that the hacker wants. They would have some level of control over that computer. <clears throat> One of the things they can do is like at a set time, the hackers may take, may tell the computers to take some form of action. Like they can direct all machines to send spam messages to, you know, millions of people, or they can all send essentially spend all machines, have them directly attack a single machine. So you have tens of thousands of computers attacking a single machine, trying to over overload it and shut it down. That is called a DOS attack or denial of service. So either you're trying to create so much traffic that nothing else can be done. You're trying to overrun that system so it's shut down or you're physically damaging that system. You're denying that system from being able to provide said service. So it's a denial of service. And there's a few different types of those we'll talk about. Uh, you can use them to perform phishing. The individual computers on these botnets are called zombies because they're kind of mindless. They're only doing what the, the, the main computer wants them to do. All the computers together are called a botnet. And again, there are hackers out there that specialize in this. What they do is they create botnets of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers, and then they will sell those bots, those botnets to another hacker who will then use them for whatever purpose. So there are people that quite literally just specialize in doing this. All right, man in the middle. Uh, this is a type of attack in which the hacker uses a couple different techniques um, to kind of position themselves in the middle of the flow of information. So it could be in between you and the router. It could be somewhere along the line of the communication in between you and the intended recipient. And kind of what they're trying to do is, is they're either sniffing for information they're manipulating information um, or you know, gathering it for later use. So an example they use right here uh, is by polluting the ARP cache, which is mapping IP addresses to MAC addresses. So you know which IP goes with which MAC so that the users on either end think they're sending information to one another when they're actually sending it to this person in the middle. So you can have it set up where I'm trying to communicate with Rachel, but Oscar has put himself in the middle. So any message I try to send to Rachel goes to Oscar. Oscar's computer sends it to Rachel. But in between, he's able to see that information. Or if he wants, he can actually change that information. <clears throat> so they can kind of monitor the entire transaction, so to speak. Um, another kind of example of this is where somebody will set up a fraudulent wireless access point this happens a lot at starbucks by the way um where they're going to kind of masquerade as the legitimate access point and eavesdrop on your wi-fi connection so they may be set up with the wireless access point they may set their computer up in hotspot mode um connecting through the wireless hotspot and then what they'll do is what's called a deauthorization attack where they essentially send the deauthorization protocol out. Everybody disconnects from the Wi-Fi. They turn theirs online and essentially it has the same name, SSID and password as the other one. So they may not get all of you, but they'll get some of you connecting to them thinking they're connected to the other network. And then they're now in between you and the other network. So, Yes, there are methods to kind of help with it, but that's kind of what they'll do is they, they set themselves up to look like a legitimate hotspot to try to capture as much traffic as they can. All right. 
Next, we heard Greg mention this one a little bit earlier, zero day. What exactly is a zero day? Well, this is a previously unknown vulnerability or attack that has been going on. So zero day would be, you know, once you know that it exists. Uh, in this, it is considered to be a zero day up until the point where a fix or a patch has been put in place to fix, to solve the vulnerability or end the attack. <clears throat> it's also one that is discovered on applications the day they're released. Here's the scary part. There are zero day attacks that have been out there for a couple of years without any fixes because the applications are not used enough or don't have enough traffic they just don't think it's you know worthwhile or the threat that they could cause by accessing these protocols is minimal so they just don't spend the time to fix them so there are cases where zero day attacks have been out there for years Ways to kind of find out these if you work in cybersecurity is to monitor known hacking community websites. Uh, cybersecurity guys and hackers tend to, you know, feed at the same troughs. They tend to view, you know, monitor the same um, chat groups and stuff like that. They like to, you know, because hackers like to share information. Um, cybersecurity experts will sleuth there to try to gain information. Um, other ways to kind of work around this or prevent it or discover it is to use things like honey pots and honey nets, as we talked about that earlier. And this can provide forensic information on what methods they're using, um, what techniques, what you know, protocols are they exploiting, things like that. They are announced on a pretty regular basis a broad range of technology systems. Now here's the danger of this. So they, they're announcing, yes, there's this vulnerability. And then it becomes an arms race between the hackers trying to exploit this vulnerability and the you know systems admins trying to shore up these weaknesses. So you need to pay attention to them so you don't get caught with your systems vulnerable because you weren't aware of a zero day vulnerability that happened. So zero day can be any type of attack or vulnerability or what have you. This is just one that is discovered to which there is no fix yet. Question. All right. Lastly, talk about violation of security best practices. So one of the easiest ways to make your system vulnerable is to not keep up with some of the best practices in the industry. You need to define the minimum security measures that is expected of each of your users. Don't let people be standing behind you when you're putting in passwords. Don't let people tailgate behind you. Um, challenge people for their credentials if they are unknown to you and in a secure area. You know, there's, there's a variety of things that you could have in place. And much of this can be um, laid out within the, what is called the AUP or acceptable use policy, um, along with the type of, and the type and ways you would use the company's internet, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. Many companies nowadays will make you sign the acceptable use policy every single time you log in. So you can't say, oh, I didn't see it. At my previous organization, when they upgraded to the newest machines, you quite literally had to agree to and sign the AUP every single time you logged into the system. And it will tell you, you know, like, you can't go to gambling sites. You can't go to pirating sites. You can't, you know, like, so there's a long list of places you cannot go or, or ways in which you cannot use the system. Um, you can't download unapproved applications to the system. You cannot, you know, use it for streaming of music or video. So they'll have a bunch of things that they'll say you're not allowed to do in this acceptable use. 
and they will give you consequences of noncompliance. Depending on the type of violation, they'll always say up to and including termination, depending on severity. So the first time you get it, maybe a verbal warning, second time, written warning, third time termination. So definitely remember AUP, acceptable use policy. All right. Quick quiz. Ellie, can you please put the um, link in the chat again? I sure can. Kelly, remember that question you asked about if you leave a job not on good terms? All right. After a long and entertaining journey, we should now be able to explain why security is an important element of an IT professional's role and in our personal lives. We should also be able to describe some common, common types of threats and vulnerabilities. We also should be able to identify different types of malware and social engineering threats. Some of these will be going into more detail throughout the coming days. Questions, comments, concerns, revelations, complaints. It's always such a somber ending to this. I have a comment. <laughs> What's your comment there, Rachel? Um... I was thinking um, because recently in um, doing employment search, I have been contacted via email as well as WhatsApp, um, fishing for information and people pretending to be, you know, <laughs> employers. Mm -hmm. and, or recruiters. Yes. And it's very, very intricate. Mm -hmm. Very intricate. So you have to be very careful because it can mm -hmm. look legitimate yeah. but there are certain clues to kind of let you know especially if they're asking you know Social for your birth date mm -hmm. your the bank that you bank at you know things mm -hmm. like that so yes i mean that would be weird if it was over whatsapp like how do you they would even get your number <laughs> like i mean over well, what they spam it out there you just you pick a number you send a message and hope somebody's on the other line to help to get it sometimes your number is mm -hmm. in linkedin or something like that because if you're looking for a job they may have that posted and they use that information to try to contact you hmm. that Monster... really happened to me last year that happened to me last year december mm -hmm. and yes they sent me a message on the message like messaging me I was like, who is this? And they said, they found my resume, blah, blah, blah. And they put this uh, pharmaceutical company on yeah. it. And it looked legit, but it wasn't. Yeah. So at the end of the day, they said, we can do Zoom meeting via WhatsApp. I was like, who does interview on WhatsApp? Yeah. So we started chatting. But after a minute, I realized that these people should be scamming, like they are scammers. And... Uh, I think I told them that I'm not interested on the on the job. Mm -hmm. So I decided to block the number of WhatsApp. Very so good. yeah, they'll be trying different means to try to scam people, get the people information. So I think so. Yeah. So that was like the scams and stuff like that was part of what caused the death of Career Builder and Monster because they weren't actively patrolling their sites for it. And they were also doing shady things like even six months after jobs were filled, they were still automatically reposting those jobs to try to generate traffic on their sites. So there were, you know, 80% or so of the jobs that they had on their site were jobs that were filled three, four or five months ago, but they were still reposting them, trying to get people to come and, you know, continue to have traffic on their sites because the traffic determines how much advertisements they can get 
how many companies will come to them and stuff like that. So wow. it ended up kind of being their downfall because people stopped trusting them and stopped going there because most of the jobs were either filled or they were scams. You know, so people started looking at places like LinkedIn and Indeed and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it got a little bit better. Mm. Although Mr. they still Kelly. exist there. Yes, mommy. Yeah, as we speak, look at my phone. If you can see what's there. Well, I see a phone number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you looking or... <laughs> yeah, I just get a notification. Popeye is sending me a gift card. Oh, that's awesome. I love it when they do that. You got you some chicken. <laughs> I didn't ask for it. <laughs> you respond, you know, like, hey, can you just send the chicken? No, no, no. Thanks to them. <laughs> just door dash it to me, man. It's okay. <laughs> Here, mm. I'll, I'll give you an address up the street. You can, we can meet up at the, you know. <laughs> mm. um, I also have a relative that basically, um, she said, whenever they receive emails that are suspicious and they have to, they've been told to think within the company as mm -hmm. well. If someone doesn't normally email them or higher ups, they wouldn't normally receive an email. They have to take a screenshot and send it to the IT department. Yes. That is actually very common. Let me see if I can find something here. Let me stop recording.